I'm Priscilla Barrera with the Investing News Network, and here with me today is Ayola Hughes, who's Research Manager at Row Motion. Ayola, thank you so much for joining me today. So the first question I wanted to ask you today was, what have been some of the main trends you've seen in the energy stationary storage space in the past year at a global level? And uh, how much do you expect this market to grow in 2023? Um, so I, I probably one of the biggest trends that we've seen is just, you know, new projects coming online and the, the scale of these projects. Um, so, you know, in 2022, or kind of going back historically, when you were thinking about what is a big project, you might say in the realms of, say, okay, 50 megawatt hours is, is a big project right now. And that, that's really stepped up over the last few years. So we've moved from a place where, you know, 100 megawatt hours is, is the standard, 200 megawatt hours is standard, and really gigawatt, gigawatt hour scale projects are becoming uh, more and more common. Um, in terms of growth, we, we expect 2023 to be a very strong year again. Um, so last year we saw around 75 gigawatt hours installed across the grid and behind the meter markets, and that's across all the different chemistries. Um, in 2023, we're expecting that market to, to double. And uh, we are here at the Battery Gigafactories Europe event. So I obviously wanted to ask you about uh, Europe in particular. So how does Europe's battery energy storage industry compare to other regions? And maybe if you can tell us a little bit about which countries are leading the way in this space. Yeah, definitely. So in, in general, Europe is, is quite far behind um, the US and Chinese market for stationary storage. Um, and that really comes down to, to policy um, and kind of the key things that are driving, driving storage in those different markets. So in China, last year we saw a massive increase in storage because of new policy which came in, which essentially required storage to be installed alongside um, renewables. So if you install solar, you must install storage as well. Uh, in the U.S. market, there's also been strong support from specific states, which has driven growth. So California and Texas in particular, we've seen lots of storage come in there in the last few years. Um, and also as part of the IRA, we saw the extension of the investment tax credit to incl include standalone storage for the first time. So support in the U.S. is significant also. In the European market, there's a number of barriers around uh, kind of legislation, how energy storage is defined which has restricted the market somewhat. Um, so growth has been, has been pretty limited over the last few years. Quite interesting in Europe, the, the market, which is actually the strongest, is, is all, more on the behind the meter applications. So in, in China and the US, it's really the grid market which is driving growth. In Europe, it's more behind the meter applications driving the growth. So in particular, the, the German market, um, for, for things like solar and storage, for residential, so people installing on their, their roofs, um, is, is a strong market and definitely some of the issues around energy security in the last year uh, in Europe and high energy prices has driven individuals and consumers to, to look towards kind of how can I uh, build a system in my home which is going to provide me with lower costs and better security. So that growth of solar and storage has been quite significant in, in the residential markets in Europe. And I feel like you've just answered this, but so is European legislation supporting the development of battery energy storage? And then if not, then what challenges remain for the sector to continue to expand? Um, so historically, the support's not really been there, but we are starting to see the momentum changing now. So, um, I mean, in the last few months, we've seen, I guess it's re realistically, it's Europe's reaction to the IRA um, in the form of the Net Zero Industry Act and uh, Critical Raw Materials Act, uh, which is part of the wider Green Deal industrial plan. So there's been lots of legislation put forward around how we're going to think about energy and how we're going to think about raw materials and um, energy storage was identified as one of the kind of key technologies in in this. So importance being drawn on it here as well. And what we're also seeing is uh, a full reform of the electricity market. Um, so the idea there being essentially to reform the electricity market to ensure kind of getting rid of some of the large fluctuations in prices we've seen um, and also you know, thinking about how we can integrate flexibility into the grid. So as part of that as well, they released a 10-point plan on energy storage, um, which has 10 recommendations on how they want to, you know, improve energy storage, uh, how it can access the grid. Um, and that includes a number of things, such as uh, removing one of the barriers in Europe, which is a double taxation, um, opening up the market so storage can 
take part in, in a wider range of applications. It encourages member states to set their targets. And it also looks around to kind of closing some of the financing gaps. So with this kind of 10-point plan, there's definitely support in Europe to come. Um, one barrier, I'd say, which remains in place is, is around the financing side of things. So in the US, it was very clear around this is the level of support we're going to give in terms of monetary value. Uh, in Europe, it's a lot more of a kind of searching for the money and trying to work out which member states are going to be able to give it out where. So uh, in the next few months, we'll hopefully see something a bit clearer around the financing side. Investors that might be listening to our conversation today are obviously interested to know about how energy storage might impact demand for raw materials, right? So, such as lithium or nickel. So, could you briefly explain what drives the chemistry choice in batteries for stationary storage? Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, in stationary storage, you've got to think of things slightly different to how you do in the EV space. So, your, your key things that you look for in a vehicle are, of course, long range, so high energy density. For storage, that, that kind of that goes out the window slightly. So, you, you no longer... Uh, are restricted by space. Often these, these batteries are installed in you know, deserts, big wide open spaces. So lower energy density is, is okay. Um, and what that really means is we've seen uh, kind of a shift towards what technologies are being used in these assets. So if we go back to 2020, where this market was relatively small and really acting as a, as a surplus market um, to the EV space, there was basically a 50-50 split of NCM chemistries to LA chemistries. That's really shifted over in recent years where this market has grown and people have started to think about what batteries are actually best suited to stationary applications, which is generally more on the LFP side. Um, so that now makes up kind of the majority of these batteries that are being installed in stationary storage. Um, going forwards, we, we expect LFP to continue to, to dominate. And there are a number of other emerging technologies which have potential to, I guess, disrupt LFP and also, I mean, complement it. So... You know, demand is going to be significant for all these raw materials and EV and stationary. Low batteries are really just going to kind of help alleviate some of those pressures. I'll get back to you on, on new technologies, but in your presentation today, you talked about China having legislation when it comes to the technology choice for energy storage. Can you maybe share a bit more about that? And do you see that happening in other countries or regions going forward? Um, yeah, so that, that was a bit of legislation that came through uh, last summer from the National Energy Administration. Um, and it was on the back of a number of fires that had at different storage projects or storage sites. And essentially what they did was they proposed a ban for NCM and also for sodium, sodium sulfur batteries in stationary storage, really for the large scale ones, and also advised against using second life batteries uh, in storage. So Digging a bit deeper into this, um, for NCM, it's really because they had some fire issues there. Sodium sulfur it makes up a really kind of tiny share of the market, but similarly, it was around the safety element. Second life batteries, these were generally you know, old bus batteries, which were then being used into storage assets. So these were actually often LFP batteries. But the main issue there being um, kind of currently around the warranties, ensuring the safety at once of batteries being in the vehicle frame. So with that, that piece of, in place around the second life, that was more around, you know, this is, this is our current view on it. If things improve around how people are testing these, the battery management of these second life batteries, then we'll review it. But right now, we don't think it's good enough and we don't think it's very safe. So LFP is the way to go. Um, in terms of other regions advising around a specific technology, there's not been much that we've seen yet come through. Um, it has often been more from the developer standpoint or from an integrator standpoint. So, for example, um, Tesla had a, a big fire at one of their sites in Australia a few years ago, and after that they essentially said, we're just going to use LFP in stationary storage. Um, same can be said for a number of developers uh, who basically announced we only want to use LFP in our systems because it's safer. Um, so, yeah, it's, it seems to be coming more from that level rather than a proper kind of federal or national level um, just going to circle back then to sodium ion batteries, which we heard a lot in the past month. Um, I know you just touched on it, but do you see them as a potential competitor for lithium ion in energy storage? And what are some of the advantages and disadvantages of these batteries? Um, yeah, definitely. So for sodium ion, um, just a little bit about it, I guess. So um, 
And so basically, essentially, what you're doing is you're using sodium salt instead of lithium salt. Um, sodium is, is much more abundant than lithium. Sodium is also cheaper than lithium. So, you know, on, at a surface level, that instantly makes it as an attractive option. Um, there's a number of other cost savings. You can use an aluminium current collector instead of copper, so you can save some money there. Um, on the anode side, you, you essentially use um, hard carbon instead of graphite, which at the moment is more expensive, so there's not really a supply chain set up for that. So that's something that can make it bring up the price a bit. But on a kind of cost point, the, the number being quoted generally once supply chain is up and running is around $80 per kilowatt hour. Um, so really competitive against you know LFP. At the same time, you know it it really is dependent on lithium prices. So when lithium prices are high, that price differential is going to be much bigger, and everyone's really excited about sodium iron. When lithium iron prices are coming down, then of course you know there's less excitement around sodium iron. Um, there are some other benefits with sodium iron potentially. So uh, long cycle life, which is good. You're able to, to fully discharge the battery, which is good for traveling it and makes it very safe um, and in general it's a very safe battery so yeah lots of excitement there I mean around kind of at the theoretical level of things we are starting to see quite a lot of developments happening in China which is quite exciting so um, probably the most advanced player right now is someone called Hainar Battery uh, they have a one gigawatt hour facility and they're ramping that up during this year um, and they're going to be mainly targeting two and three wheel applications and stationary storage um, and they actually have a 60 megawatt hour project which is in the pipeline and due to come online this year. So uh, lots of movement there and lots happening. As with any new technology, it takes time both for supply chain to ramp up and also for people to, to gain kind of confidence and trust that technology and adopt it more widely. So at least initially it's really going to be a China story. Um, but I mean, as I alluded to earlier, the demand is so significant for these batteries that you know, having the option of some sodium ion there is, is not really going to be a, a kind of massive threat. Could this type of batteries be a disruptor in the electric vehicle uh, market as well then? Um, yep, definitely we're seeing some interest there. There's been a few test vehicles which have come out of China, so um, Pharisis and I've forgotten the name, but there's, there's been a few different cell manufacturers who've put um, sodium ion batteries into test vehicles in recent months. Um, it's worth noting with this, so in China, the kind of the general process is you have a battery put into a test vehicle, and then this vehicle uh, appears, um, and then it'll take some time to enter the market. So right now it's just on in kind of the test stage. It's not on the MIT list yet. And speaking from kind of a previous example of when we've seen a new tech, a battery, a vehicle with a new battery appear on the MIT list, it, it takes a long time for that to actually uh, hit the road in some cases. So... It's, uh, it, they will come for sure. Um, we think at least in its current state, it's really going to be limited to small vehicles. So you're thinking about your A, B, maybe C class segment vehicles with, with a low range. So you'd be typically kind of your city cars, where you're picking in the Chinese market where you're maybe doing 50 to 100 kilometers a day. Uh, quite, has quite strong potential. And just my last question for you today, what other catalysts should investors consider when looking at the energy stationary storage market globally and what could impact this sector in 2023? Um, so I, I think anything around kind of the wider energy markets is, is going to be big, big for this. So, you know, if any investment pours into the renewable space, so uh, as we see more going into solar and, and wind, of course, storage is going to benefit from that as well. A closer, closer eye on what's happening in the renewable markets is, is really important as well. Um, but yeah, I think in general, it's, it's an exciting year in terms of new technologies coming through. Um, you know, on the flow battery side as well, there's also quite a lot of excitement in China. Um, there are other players looking at sodium iron outside of China as well, which have some good progress. So uh, I think, yeah, it's really a kind of a big year of technology disruptors and new things coming through. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you.